Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's webinar. Today's seminar topic is expatriation planning for U.S. citizens and residents. Our presenters today are attorneys Gary Forrester and Brian Page. If you'd like a copy of today's presentation, you'll find it in the handout section of the webinar interface. Similarly, if you have a question, you can type it into the questions section of the webinar interface. And now let me turn it over to our presenters. Go ahead, Gary and Brian. Hello, thanks for attending. Today we're going to present an interesting seminar. It's not a seminar uh, that most people would actually apply directly, but it's got great background information and it's very, very applicable. You wouldn't imagine it, but it's very, very applicable to people from other countries living in the U.S. who may decide to go back uh, to, their, to their homeland. It's expatriation, which means different things to different people for U.S. citizens and uh, U.S. residents. I'm going to turn off our um, camera, and you guys are going to see the slides only, if I can find the camera thing. Um, oh, there it is. And we will get started. Um, let's take a look at the introduction, which is going to work through our topics today. Um, we're going to go through an overview of what an expatriation tax is, how it works, what's the political motivation behind taxing people for leaving the United States. Um, how do we how do we determine when it happens? W when does residency start? When does it terminate? Um, you know, there's a whole series of laws that um, tax laws that started in the late 90s. Um, which which was intended to to basically capture people leaving the country who were going to change their tax status uh, to pay lower tax, less tax to the U.S. in particular, and 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 what was done to try to prevent that. Um, we go into the details of uh, Section 877, which was the first law, and then we work through the exit tax, which is the existing law. And then we we also discuss the inheritance tax, which is kind of like a, an estate tax for expatriates. It's fairly complicated, but we'll keep it. We'll try to keep it light. If you have a question, there's a there's a spot in the uh, window on your screen to raise your hand, and we will take all questions anytime you want during the presentation. We welcome your questions. Uh, let's go to the second slide. Um, I wanted to set up um, some of the political motivation. A lot of times when we do these seminars, um, it's a little dry to just think about these laws in a vacuum without really understanding what went on um, with respect to the po politics that drove the law. In the late 90s, you, had, you, be, you started to see what are known as disregarded entities and uh, certain tax breaks occurred. This was a throw-in. This expatriation was a throw-in to one of the um, legislations that, you know, the, the idea was that it was going to decrease overall tax. So this was going to increase tax. What went on basically was it was a focus on the non-citizen U.S. resident. So although expatriation is considered um, the, 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 the time, the moment at which a U.S. citizen gives up US, their U.S. connection, they hand in their passport, the focus of the law really wasn't on the U.S. citizen. Um, there had been some large expatriations. There, there was uh, the guy who owned Carnival Cruise Line expatriated. And, and, and the upshot of that basically is you, you go from being a U.S. citizen taxed on your income worldwide. So if you're a U.S. citizen, it, it doesn't matter where you earn income. You're taxed by the U.S. on that income um, to going to a non-citizen, non-resident, not taxed on any uh, income unless it's sourced in the U.S. or you sell an asset you know, which is what's called U.S. situs. It's basically an asset with a link to the U.S. So you can, if you're, if most of your assets are not in the United States, you kind of become a non-U.S. taxpayer. 
That's the citizen. A few of those occurred, and we we're dealing. We've dealt with a number of them, but more more significant, and really why I believe that that Clinton era law, um, the first expatriation law, came into into play was the following format. And this is a scenario we'll refer to during the whole presentation because it's, it, this was really a very common situation. So the law and the current law is really similar. Uh, if you are a non-citizen, non-resident, you're English, let's say you're English, you live in England, you're not a resident here for either income or state tax purposes. We'll get into some detail on what that means in terms of being a resident. Um, you can buy and sell uh, stock, U.S. stock, at no capital gains. So people from all over the world buy and sell stock um, on our on our um, exchanges, and they pay no capital gains, even though the stock being sold is U.S. based, U.S. source, um, nexus type property. They don't. The foreigner does not pay tax. It's very on. It's not very well known, actually. Very few U.S. citizens really understand that. So it's meant to increase foreign investment, et cetera, bring money into the country. Um, but and there's no distinction between like an IBM stock in IBM or a very large company, people buy Apple, whatever, and stock in a very small company. If you sell the stock, you sell the stock. There's no there's no tax if you're not a resident and you're not a citizen. So what went on for years was you had this, this, you know, let's say this individual in England who had a, let's say they were in the car business of some sort or the car parts business or whatever the business was. They said, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to start a huge business in the U.S. because I've got a huge business in England and Europe. Um, and I'm going to go to my tax advisor to see exactly how I want to get it started, ramp it up, and sell it. And the reality was that people would come here, create a huge business, and then leave, right? They're not citizens. They just go back. Now they are they went from being a resident taxed on their worldwide income to being a non-resident and a non-citizen. So what happened? They built the business up. And then they sold the stock as a non-resident, non-citizen, no tax, no capital gains. This went on for years. So a lot of us in the foreign tax arena believed at that time, I was a fairly young lawyer. I know it, it's hard to believe I was ever young, but in 1996, um, we, we pretty much, the, 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 basically the discussions, congressional discussions and some of the explanations and the law, basically that they didn't want people to just come in create the business, and then leave, become a non-resident, and then sell the business at no tax. They wanted that tax. That drove this expatriation law. So now Brian's going to go through a lot of detail on this, but we started with a law where, where basically you had to wait a period of time. All right? So, so you had your business in the U.S. and you left. We had to leave, you know, and stay gone for 10 years before you could sell the business. And then we went into a different regime um, where there was no time period. You were just out of luck. If you came here and you ended up leaving um, and you didn't want to be treated as a U.S. Uh, resident for tax purposes, um, you basically expatriated your residence, you are subject to an immediate tax. Um, we're on the first slide here, and and we we're just trying to set this to set the table a little bit on this exit tax, which is listed on the slide here if you permanently leave the U.S. And then also there's a corresponding inheritance tax, which is similar to the estate tax in I mean, in, in in terms of it being dealing with gifts and estates um, for the expatriate. Go ahead, Brian. Sure. So under the current regime, which basically began for us now in 2008, we have a, a dual structure for tax. We have an income tax-based component, which is the exit tax, and then we have an inheritance tax component, which is under subtitle B. It's a transfer tax, or like an estate tax or gift tax. And 
if you if the non-resident long-term resident leaves and they're caught in this net you you have both of these taxes that will apply the exit tax is a is a deemed sale on all their worldwide assets the day before they expatriate um so the idea being that if they leave, they wanted to capture all the capital gains uh, in that tax year, and then they, they leave. And that's just part of it. Um, what's interesting, though, is that the inheritance tax on the other side is if they're a covered expatriate and that this applies to this individual, any future transfer or gift to a U.S. beneficiary um, will also incur a 40% flat tax on the gross value of the, the, the gift or bequest. And what's, it, what's it interesting about all this is that the donee, the recipient of this gift, pays the tax. Because that's the person who the, the U.S. can get, can get right. within the net, get their hooks into the individual still here. It's an odd tax, this inheritance tax, actually. Uh, so, so you, that's what you face. You face it both either as a, as a green card holder who's gone, gives up the green card or a citizen who's expatriate. And what's also interesting, and we'll talk about this more later is, is that even the, so the person who receives the gift and pays this tax, they don't get a step up in basis for the tax right. paid, which is unique. Unlike the estate tax where you would, you would get a fair market value step up. That's not the case for this inheritance tax. Mm -hmm. So as relates to those U.S. citizens, if they want to expatriate, which means that they want to renounce their citizenship, they would do it at an embassy or consulate. Um, there, there are some steps you have to go through to actually do it. It's unique for citizens, um, and it's basically there are four ways to actually do it. Now, one is that you have to file an INS form I-407. That's the most common. Um, the other is is that you you show up at the United States State Department and you tell them that you that you want to leave and they issue you a certificate. Um, those are the two main ones. You can also have a court um, terminate your citizenship. That's rare, but it can also happen. So those those are the main ways. And when that occurs, that's the the date in which a snapshot is taken of the citizen. Their net worth their annual average income taxes over the last five years, and also tax compliance. They look at all these things at once. And if you fit in any of these tests, this net is thrown on you. And from then on, not only will you have the market to market on your worldwide assets on that date, but then you're a covered expatriate after for the inheritance tax. You from know, then on. And a lot of people think of the um, expatriates as these people who kind of decide to live in another country because a lot of times uh, collo colloquially it's referred to as an expat or you're an expat and you're living in Mexico or you're living in Philippines or whatever. Um, those are not expats. Those are not expatriates. Those are just people who are living in other countries. This expatriation tax applies to the technical um, renunciation of U.S. citizenship or if you're here as a non-citizen and you leave and we'll go through how you fit into that and it's interesting there are two types of, of renouncing there's one for immigration purposes mm -hmm. and then one for taxes so it's possible to do one or the other and actually mess this up uh, it's important that it's done the correct way and and you expatriate under both things both immigration and u.s and taxes if not if you want to if you want to if you want to if you actually want to leave but we have had clients in the past that thought they did and they were pulled back into the net after they had a substantial inheritance overseas yeah so you just have to be careful with it because um again with the with the non-citizen the non-citizen has to go through the practice from a tax perspective Sometimes they hand back in the green card with, um, you know, we had one handed in and, and the CPA was not aware of how expatriation from a tax side worked. And basically they had done some my, mild planning, but they had not expatriated for tax purposes. So for all these period of years, they were still a U.S. 
resident green card holder tax on worldwide income. It becomes very significant, uh, just to make a point, it becomes very significant when someone's here, like let's say their kids are in school or there's some kind of reason they're here for a period of time, and um, they're taxed on their worldwide income, they know that, and then they go back, and and most of their income and assets are outside the country. Well, the U.S. doesn't care if you're if you're really still a green card holder slash resident, you're taxed by the U.S. on your worldwide income. And they're they're thinking, well, we don't really have much in the U.S. We're just going to pay our local government. Um, but it's a it's a rude awakening when the liens start coming out on their U.S. assets. And then a lot of times there's a there's a treaty or there's a tax information exchange agreement between the two countries, and the IRS can actually place liens on their assets in their home country. So it's it's it becomes very complicated. Um, but the but the real rude awakening typically is for the resident here who doesn't realize that they've they either don't realize they've expatriated or they tried to expatriate and it didn't make it happen correctly. So when we say for non-U.S. citizens, what we what we mean here are long-term residents, which are green card holders that have enjoyed U.S. residency for eight out of the past 15 tax years within the date of renunciation. Mm -hmm. um, these are the individuals normally that can come here. They, they start a business. Maybe they have kids in school. And they don't realize when they decide to head back that they're caught in this net. That's the most common. And what's interesting is, is that it's basically a green card test, not a substantial presence test, mm -hmm. which is interesting, but that's the way that they wrote the law. The other is, is that green cards in and of themselves, they expire after 10 years of issuance. But to avoid this status, you have to formally relinquish your permanent a residency. So even if you turn it in or it expires on its own and the, and the non-resident, I'm sorry, the, the long-term resident leaves, they think, that, oh, I'm gone. That's not the case. And the 8 to 15 years can also be sometimes tricky from people coming in and out. You know, you actually really have to count up that eight years, whether you're here for, you know, two years, you know, and then all for one, et cetera. Um, when, you, when you enter this status, you need to plan with respect to the exit if you have significant uh, assets because you're going to be subject to this mark-to-market -market tax on what you have all over the world. And it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty daunting to people when we have them in the office and we start to talk about the fact that they've got $100 million in Brazil, they've got $80 million in Portugal, and they've got $2 million in the U.S., and the IRS wants money on all the money in their whole, in their whole <laughs> earth, and they don't even hardly speak English. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> now, how is this determination made? Well, under tax law, for at least for income taxes, we have what's called a residency start date. And this is important because this is the time frame, the date in which we look to see when they – formally leave if they fall under this 8 to 15 years. Basically, you know, it's when they get their green card and they and they and they enter the United States. That's the main way when it starts. But it's important though, there are two different regimes. That's for income taxes, but for transfer to taxes, it's not based on the green card or substantial presence, it's based on domicile and what that means. And so it's possible to be an income tax resident for U.S. taxes, but not for transfer and vice versa. And we, we see this a lot where there's, a, there's some planning opportunities with this, but it can also be a pitfall if you don't know what's going on and, and you don't plan. It's a, great, it's a great way to plan sometimes. If it, if it presents itself as an opportunity, Sometimes we can avoid, for instance, the mark-to-market tax. We can get out away from the estate tax while still being taxed as a U.S. income tax resident. We can, we can use the two definitions against themselves such that we can, we can, for instance, leave the country with no intent to return. We're no longer a state tax resident. We're still an income tax resident, and we can control when the mark-to-market hits, and we control – 
the amount of assets we have subject to it when it hits. Absolutely. And then the termination date is pretty straightforward. It's when their individual is no longer a lawful permanent permanent resident, which means is they surrender their green card and they have also for both tax and immigration purposes left. Mm -hmm. Why is it important? Well, to the expatriation date is important because we have two tax regimes, one of which was in effect from 04 to 08, and that's under section 877. And then anything that occurred after June 17, 2008 is under the new 877A. It's important because the, the rules are a little different and the planning is different. But for 877 especially, the main thing there was the tenure taint. Yeah, and that's and we're starting to get, we had for a while the crossover where, where we had a unintentional expatriation or whatever we were dealing with on planning. And someone had left in the initial, during the, the application of the initial regime, um, you know, before June 17th, 08, but, but the subsequent regime also applied for different things. Um, that was complicated to say the least because it actually is a totally different uh, tax regime. We're starting to get away from that because of the, because the 10 years associated with the 10 year taint is starting to become impossible, which is great by the way, um, for figuring it out not great for the tax because the new tax is very onerous. It's also important too because um, you know 877A was an overlay on the prior 877. So we have to understand both to be able to apply the new 877A and how it applies and the definitions used because right. it specifically refers in the code back to 877. Mm -hmm. This way, eight, Section 877, we're just going to give you a, just a brief overview of how it worked. We've talked about it a little bit, but it reclassifies the expatriate for U.S. income, estate, and gift taxes for the 10-year period from expatriation if they were present in the, in the United States after they left for more than 30 days. Well, it's, it's even, and it's, and Brian's make, is simplified this very nicely, but so if we go back to the person from England who started the business in Florida and says, okay, I'm just going to go back to England. I'm not going to be a U.S. resident for income tax purposes uh, or state really. Um, and then I'm going to sell my stock. Stock is tax-free, sell stock. There's no capital gains for non-resident, non-citizens. This was the law that said, no, 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 no. If you, if you leave, You've got to wait 10 years to sell the stock before you can get away with, with uh, tax-free status. Of course, that was the that was the kind of the promise. <laughs> but now we have now we have a new rule, and the new rule the new rule says no 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 no. If you leave uh, during this new period, you're taxed you're taxed immediately on exit. So there really wasn't a reprieve. Uh, I, I think I think this was you know something you could plan for this 10 year issue. You no longer can can plan for it at all. What's tricky about this this old law was you, you had a 10 year period. You could you might be able to plan for that. You know you put someone into the business, um, run the business, and wait your period of, your your tanked out. Um, it says if present in the U.S. for more than 30 days, right? Now if you're not present in the U.S. for more than 30 days, there's another regime, which we're not going to get into because it's beyond, it's beyond the scope of something you it could even apply anymore, it's, really. It's, so. it's, right. right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very light, the application now, because it's, the law is getting old. But I mean, this is how complicated it was. And then you had to kind of compare the two regimes and whichever was worse, of course, applied. But just to give you a flavor of how that worked. <laughs> the, the important thing for us to know now is uh, 877 established three tests uh -huh. that would throw the net over the person who expatriated. And these these definitions were 
reintroduced and they apply under the 877A. So that's why we're going to talk about them here. But basically when the person leaves on the date of their termination date of their residency, they take a snapshot and they look at these three things. One of which is they, they look at the five prior tax years, what the annual net income tax was. And it's threshold each year, it does go up for inflation, but that's that's the first test. So if you failed that and it, it, you went over the threshold, it applied. Likewise, the same with the net worth test. Now there is no inflation on the net worth. It's $2 million from the date of expatriation. That could be planned with potentially. Oh, absolutely. And then lastly, and this is the kicker, not only do you have to fall under these two things, but even if your person was under the threshold for the net income tax and for their net worth, if they fail to file form 8854 for the prior five tax years, it still applies. Which is a very com which common, is the prob which is the problem. Yeah. That's what, what happens is it, the way the law works is if you don't certify tax compliance, um, the first two exceptions don't apply. You kind of, you kind of, you kind of like what? <laughs> I didn't, I didn't make enough money. Great, okay, great. You have more than two million? No. Um, well, did you certify tax compliance? And and they look at you, and the CPA looks at you, and it's like, well, guess you're back, back in the net. <laughs> and this has nothing to do with immigration status. This is tax status. Right. Okay. So if you're pulled into this in the old regime you had an alternative tax regime for 10 years from the date of expatriation. You basically remained a, a U.S. Right, and, and the reason that was important was because there are certain exclusions from income tax if you're a non-resident like non capital gain. citizen, which is the major one. Mm -hmm. Transfer taxes are, are a little different, but if it applied, you were still deemed U.S. resident. So if you made a transfer on your worldwide assets, a gift, a gift occurred. You had to pay tax on the gifts and the death tax occurred. Everything occurred for the 10 years. Right. So hopefully they didn't die within the 10 years with substantial worldwide assets if this applied. So that is 877 at a broad stroke. So you kind of get a flavor for how it worked. Now, this is the current regime of effective as of 2008. This is the exit tax. This is 877A. Um, it applies to U.S. citizens and the long-term permanent residents. The same definitions from 877. If it applies, you have a market to market for your worldwide assets. It's, the, it's a deemed sale of everything you own anywhere. So on an American expatriation, you're you're working toward avoiding capital gains, as as you know, in an obvious way, you can you can start start moving assets, you know, paying capital gains, moving assets into into other non-taxable situations. Um, but as a as a non-resident who doesn't have assets here. This becomes this is where it becomes very very onerous when there's we, we deal with people who, who can have hundreds of millions of dollars in other countries who have not planned for this mark to market issue. And then we also so have the inheritance. Yeah. And then on the backside of that, even after you leave, later on, if you make a gift to a U.S. resident, you would have an inheritance tax, which is the forty percent if you're covered. So if if it applies to you when you exit, yeah. So so. Sometimes, well, for instance, the last one, we we got the mark to market down pretty low, okay? What had happened was the people had come here while their kids were in school and they were here for the eight or 15 year period, <clears throat> but the kids wanted to stay. So we got the mark to market down on expatriation, which quote expatriation, you know, for a non-citizen, non but they couldn't really make gifts to their kids after that. Um, remember, in the U.S. or out, right? In the U.S. or out. So most of the assets are out, but the kids are in the U.S. They and they decided to stay after school. That never happens, right? And so they were trapped in in this inheritance tax issue. 
and that will work out over time. I'm, I'm confident. <laughs> <laughs> As with 877, 877A has the three tests for to be a covered expatriate. You have the net worth test, which is a $2 million threshold. You have the annual uh, tax income tax liability test for five years. Now, this is indexed which is nice, it helps a little bit. And then you also have the, the failure to certify tax compliance, which is the form 8854. So basically the same regime we had before, just that the uh, the net income tax is indexed and it, it will go up each year just a, a little bit. So the market to market regime, what does that mean? Well, as, as Gary explained, it is the unintended tax sale for income tax purposes of all the worldwide assets on the date of expatriation. And it's valued as if the expat died on, on the day before they expatriated. So that's how they determine the fair market value. When some of them find out, they, they, we've had a few just pass out. When we hadn't, we didn't, you know, actual death, right? No, no, actual no. death, right? No, we, no, just kidding. But, but it's, it can be pretty daunting to the, to the client to be perfectly at, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, you do, you do get the step up though. It's, it is as if you sold the asset and you, and it, you do get an adjustment in basis. So that's the exemption on the slide. That, that's, um, let's see, the exemption. Yeah, okay. So, so you, anything, any of the gain that is below that amount, you don't pay any tax right. for 2020. Right. It's indexed as well. It goes up a little bit each year. What's interesting though, is that even though for US income tax purposes, you get a step up, but the their new home country might not recognize it. it depending on if they have a treaty or not, because it was an actual sale, it was a deemed sale, which is interesting. It's interesting to us and frightening to them. Um, what What, Brian's saying is that um, the very few countries actually actually impose a capital gains tax. So, in in our situation, if if someone expatriates, they're subject to deemed capital gains, and they they get a step up a basis, so that you know, um, if they ever actually really sell the asset, um, there's no more U.S. capital gains tax. But, the, but again, the issue is if someone's here sub, subject to the expatriation tax, but most of their assets are in different countries, um, a lot of those countries don't really care that you got a deemed step up in basis from the U.S. If you don't fit into their, quote, capital gains tax, you're going to have to pay tax on those assets again when you sell them. Now, there are some uh, deferral rules for assets, for certain types of assets under this regime. And as long as uh, the, the expat gives adequate security, they can defer the tax until it's sold, actually sold later or disposed That is a nice, it is a nice part of it. The, the other interesting thing about this, it might be possible for a green card holder to make an unintended expatriation. Yeah. Which we've seen if, if they go to another country, they leave the United States, and, and they reside in the new country and they file their taxes and take treaty benefits. Yeah, if you take a treaty benefit that deems you back outside the country, you may have just triggered the mark to market regime. That's the income tax side. The inheritance tax side is on the transfer tax side. And, and as we discussed, this is basically a double tax. So if you're a covered expatriate and you leave, and years later you decide to make gifts to a U.S. beneficiary, this inheritance tax is going to apply, regardless of what happened before with the market market in the past. It's an odd. It's an odd. It looks. It seems to me very politically driven. This inheritance tax. Um, basically, what they're saying is you left, and you need to stay gone. I don't know why. I, maybe maybe Brian has a comment. Actually, we haven't really discussed this. I don't know why they don't want assets coming back to a U.S. beneficiary. Do you? My only thought is is that they they were concerned with transfer tax arbitrage. 
Yeah, you mean they get the step up and they push it back in? Right. I, maybe. I, I, I thought of that, but it's kind of odd. I guess the capital gains would be at a lower rate, of, or at least right now. But they the already paid tax. the mark to mark. I mean, it's like it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's, this one's tricky. I'm not sure what was going on with <laughs> this. We're not sure. I mean, it's but what, what, what's, what's really odd about the inheritance tax is it doesn't expire. So you can't you can't wait 10 years or some period of time where after which you can then make gifts to a US resident. You just can't you can't make gifts to US residents anymore. The money cannot come back in. It's forever tainted unless yeah. unless the US Benny leaves the US. Right. The other interesting thing is, as we discussed before, there's no basis step up. So if, if the recipient receives the gift, they pay that 40%, they don't get a step up, which is another- It's just a penalty tax, yeah. Basically, penalty tax. And as we said, there's no, there's no, um, there's no time limit on this. And talk about you know an aspect of tax law that most tax practitioners have no background in, the inheritance tax you know, aspect of the, what basically is an exit tax. This, I mean, it's, this is, this is very, very, this requires a lot of counsel. And, and we, we counsel a lot of uh, CPAs handling a lot of expatriation, a lot of foreign, uh, a lot of foreign work. And you really have to walk through this stuff years before the people leave and have a plan because with the plan, I would say with the plan, you can really get this down. But but it it just so happens that really very few people that we've seen at all have any plan at all when they return to their countries. Um, we have done planning for U.S. citizens because it's such a you know when you're a U.S. citizen it's really much more weighty in your mind if you're going to give up your passport. It's usually a very wealthy person who's doing it for for tax purposes and 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 really knows that there's probably going to be a lot of planning involved. It's the non-citizen. It's the non-citizen with significant assets abroad that says, you know, I don't really have anything here. I don't really make any money here. Why? What's a big deal? It's a big deal. We often see them after the fact. They've already done this and they come to us or there's some issue or they're, they're, they want to do it immediately. They've already bought a house or they want to leave. Oh, it's a full depression. It's like a full, <laughs> I mean, if we could, if we could prescribe drugs, we would do it for these people. I mean, it's, but we typically though, I would say work it out. And I have had a lot of conversations um, with the head of international tax who handles actually Orlando. They're in Miami, but they handle Orlando. And they're somewhat willing to discuss it and, and deal with it if it was truly unintentional. We have a question. So after the ag exit tax is calculated and paid, how are US trustees, uh, brokers, uh, on deferred accounts notified? Is there an, a W-8 Ben? Yes. Yes. And and how do we uh, how do we account for for the exit tax paid in future years for the covered expat? Well, I will talk about um, compliance here in a little bit, but there there's a yearly form that um, you will have to file with the IRS that will update them informationally on, on what, what has occurred. And what's sold, what's kept, yeah. Each year. And it, especially if you, if you have a non grantor mm -hmm. trust. Right. We have another question. Given, the, given that currently the market is depressed, uh, uh, lower defendable uh, FMV, uh, and the future uh, will be significantly increased capital gains rates. Does it not make sense to have a plan to expatriate if if Dems hit uh, a grand slam in November? Grand slam. Grand slam. That's um, more, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. If you get out, you you should get out now. Well, <laughs> before January twenty first or whatever the date is of the inauguration. Well, the exit yeah. tax is just based on the capital gains rate. Remember that. Remember with a very small revision. This this was a significant revision that the uh, A they put on that. But but with a very small revision, they don't they could make it not the capital gains rate, but they could add fifteen percent. I, by the way, that probably will happen. If you have if you have some kind of a significant exodus of billionaires out of the U.S., 
who who plan, who basically figure out how to get the capital gains rate down. We've done it a number of times. Um, what they'll do is they'll 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 have a look back period. Uh, they'll change the rate to add 10 or 20 percent to the capital gains rate. Absolutely. The, it, the answer is yes. If you think you're going to leave and suffer the exit tax and you can plan for that, you would want to do that sooner than later. OK. And also with interest rates being so low, doesn't it make sense to pay the exit tax with borrowed money than posting security on a, a deferral? Well, that's a that's a financial calculation. That's a little bit different question. Now, what we're gonna hit um, in a couple in a, one or two slides here, the financial question. That's hard. That's you gotta you gotta work the numbers on that, and a lot of that's prediction. But in terms of the um, avoidance, there's some real tax avoidance you can do with fairly standard estate planning strategies, which does involve the interest rate. Um, where we have a sale of assets, um, or, uh, where we move assets out of the estate and, re and receive back a payment, either interest or some kind of annuitized payment. So yeah. that's really when it would come into play, I think. Okay, another question here. Uh, if a green card is confiscated at one of the exit ports, is that treated as a revocation of the green card status for the U.S. tax purposes? I would think so, but not for tax purposes. No, no that's an get, immigration issue. That's immigration. You have to file the um, your your compliance eighty eight to fifty four to formally terminate your status for, tax. for taxes. Okay, I just have just a few more here, and I'll let you get back to your presentation. Um, if a green card holder returns to their home country after the eight year time period and are joined by their U.S. citizen spouse. Uh, that that is not expatriating. Do they still incur these taxes? Uh, yeah, I mean they still incur it to the to the extent of title. So if the spouse retains title, then it's then there was no expatriation of title. But if the if the expatriate has title, it triggers expatriation. I, well, I mean, it, and also if the green card, they would have to make sure they formally terminate their U.S. Residency. Yeah, I think they're yeah, assuming if, if they assuming they did, then yeah, then, yeah, titling would be very important for that analysis. Yeah, and that would be a great planning opportunity, most likely. You probably could avoid a lot of it with that. And, and husband and wife planning is very common. Okay, uh, if you have U.S. heirs, does it make sense to use the FUC to gift prior to expatriating, if if you will be a covered expatriate? FUC. I'm not sure what an FUC is. You mean the unified credit? Maybe the unified, unified, unified credit. credit. Oh, oh, yeah. There, there are definitely some standard family unified credit. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. Um, we'll talk here in a minute, slides, but there, there are definitely some opportunities to utilize the standard U.S. transfer tax mm -hmm. planning before you expatriate. It, it, it does. It serves two purposes. But that also requires planning because there is a clawback potentially, depending on how the gift is done, because they treat it as if you died, the three year pullback. Oh, yeah, you have to do it three years before, right? Sure. Right. Unless it's a spouse, that would be the mm -hmm. exception to that. Okay, go ahead, get back to your presentation, gentlemen. Okay, sure. Thanks, Tom. Uh, as for the inheritance tax, the other things here that are points I think are important. This is a lot like, so if you have a foreign trust, with U.S. bennies, and uh, you have a covered expatriate, and they they happen to create one after they leave to benefit the U.S. beneficiary, you have to be in, you have to pay attention to this inheritance tax because it doesn't go away. It's not necessarily at the time that the the the, the covered expat makes the, the transfer to the foreign trust, but when the distribution is actually made to the U.S. recipient, and so they're a lot like the. GST tax, there can be an inclusion ratio. So you need to be aware of that. And the best planning would be is if it's done after the fact, it's easy because it's all going to be covered. But if, if it's a prior foreign trust and you have gifts afterwards, it probably makes sense to have subtrust. So you have an, a, a ratio of zero and one for accounting. It's a lot easier to handle it like yeah, that. Yeah, you divide. If you have an existing foreign trust and you expatriate, um, the money that was in there bef before may be exempt from the inheritance tax 
the money that goes in after um, is going to be tracked because if that money gets distributed out to U.S. beneficiary, it's going to be subject to this expatriation tax. You got to you basically divide it up. That includes any gains that occur inside of the trust over time or appreciation. The other is there is an exception to this. You can get around this, but if you domesticate the foreign trust, right. But that also puts you under a regime where you're having withholding all that kind of stuff. That so it works if there's if it's mostly U.S. assets. That works pretty well. But this right. thing with, with where you have a foreigner with mostly foreign assets, it's not. This is really bad. <laughs> really bad. We talked about the compliance here. It's this form 8854. You seem to be aware of it. It's, this is a pitfall we see a lot. Make sure it's filed. Um, and if you have a non granary trust, every year you have to file this. Also, you need to make sure you file a, a Form W8CE. Make sure it's done in the timeline there at the time on the date of expatriation or 30 days after, depending on the facts. You need to be aware of that. That's also a pitfall that we see a lot from a compliance standpoint. As for the strategies, a lot of things can be done potentially to plan to leave. And we, mm -hmm. we, we've kind of touched on this and you know, a lot of these things here are, can be really in depth, but we want to just give you a flavor for different types of things you're, you're able to do. Yeah, if you're not super wealthy also, it's quite easy. Yes, it's quite easy. One is just to, to fall below the, the $2 million net worth and do that by, by gifts other things and, and you can use your federal unified credit if you're a u.s resident assuming you plan and you don't do it within three years you be careful with that that's the you know that's one of the easier ways especially if you're not as wealthy to get mm -hmm. below yeah the the um income tax the annual net income tax is a little harder to plan around but potentially over time if you plan it you might mm -hmm. be able to, to make it look better on paper one, one of the other options is an expatriation trust that is designed to get your net worth below, but still allows the individual either to one, utilize their unified credit or use an incomplete gift and then potentially have it includable in a, in a taxable estate later if they want to avoid the mark to market. There might be a reason to do that. It might not be. That's one of the, the planning options or a power of appointment would also be something that you might use because you want it to be included because if it's included in the uh, federal estate tax, the exit tax does not apply to the assets. Mm -hmm. You get the step up. But, and, and you get the step up. So, yeah. But that's, I think it's a good point. So we're always thinking about the differences between income and estate tax and how to pit one against the other. The other option would be for domicile planning for transfer taxes. Mm -hmm. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but you can be an income tax resident in the U.S., but be domiciled in another country for, for U.S. transfer taxes, which would enable you for transfer taxes to make transfers of foreign assets and not be subject to the U.S. estate or gift tax. Well, it, it allows you to move. You, you, you basically leave the country. The idea is that you don't intend to return. You don't give up the green card, okay? You still are, you know, you still are covered by the net, but from an estate tax perspective, you're not going to have to pay gifts on transfers of foreign assets, and you can reduce down the value substantially. I don't know if you, if these very wealthy people are going to get it under two million dollars, but you can definitely do some planning uh, with respect to the mark to market tax. One of the other ways potentially is you can sell the sell the personal residence. It's it's an exception to the income tax rule under 121. You can sell it and avoid because you're you know, it's not going to be in taxable income potentially. You have to be careful with that too. You have to actually sell. I think you have to actually sell the residence um, uh, to eliminate you know the issue of of capital gains. We don't think that if you have a residence in the US and you're subject to mark to market that you get a freebie on the residence for the deemed sale. I don't think so. Not for the deemed sale. I don't think but so. But for the actual yeah, sale. The, yeah, I think yeah. You, you actually have to sell 
You actually, have to sell. well, it's tricky. It's tricky, it's but tricky. I think you actually have to sell. And then, lastly, the the standard planning to get your by, by leveraging your federal unified credit before you leave the standard tax savings strategies that we would use things like grats, sales to idgets, things like that. This would take planning in advance, but there are ways that to get your net worth down so you might avoid the net when you leave. Mm -hmm. And at least in the state tax. In, in, in the state tax, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So now we would take any further questions. We've hit the 50 minutes. Um, I think it's like 52 minutes now or something like that. Um, for any uh, buddy has any more questions, thanks so much for joining us.